Good morning, everybody. All right. My name is Joel Miranda. I am the Director of Leadership Development and Graduate Leadership at YouthBuild USA. Uh, now, I first came to know YouthBuild uh, many years ago as a young man who had dropped out of high school, disconnected from society, lost faith in everyone around him, including himself. At YouthBuild, I was met by a loving and supportive community that believed in my abilities, challenged me and empowered me to be greater than society had ever told me I could be. Thanks to that experience, to the love and the opportunity that was extended to me, now many years later, I have the privilege of serving young people across the country as they, as they tap into their amazing ability and potential to rebuild their lives, their families, and their communities. And I've learned over the years right, that the power that young people have, the power that they possess, like energy, is neither created nor destroyed, but rather transformed from one form to another. And it is all of our responsibility to make sure that we tap into that amazing energy, that amazing potential for good. Now I want you all to close your eyes for a few seconds. Close your eyes, clear your, clear your heads for a sec. And I want you all to envision, to imagine what the world could look like if young people from low-income communities shared the power of their stories if they brought their knowledge of the conditions of poverty and what needs to be done to change them with recommendations drafted by young people, if they mobilized a broad, united constituency of low-income young people who make themselves heard at every opportunity and through every pathway to influence public policy and public investments into the political and policy-making realm to create change, if we became their allies in creating a world that they aspire to live in rather than one that we impose on them, how would the headlines read? What statistics, uh, discoveries, and accomplishments would we be uh, celebrating? How many wars would be ended for good? And what opportunities would exist for our young people? And I want you all to open your eyes and take a look at the group, the amazing group that stands on this stage. The National Council of Young Leaders, consisting of young people from 14 national youth engaging organizations, is the only diverse group of young people from low income communities that has come together to produce a platform for change. Now, for some history on that platform and the council, I'd like to invite uh, Council Member Adam Strong from Youth Build USA to share some, some history on the council. Thank you. In uh, 2012, I and the rest of the founding members of the National Council of Young Leaders gathered to pull our ideas and perspectives as we were all young leaders you know, across the country who climbed out of poverty and thanks in part to our um, opportunities presented to us by our sponsoring organizations. And it was really just a phenomenal experience as we were all so unique and we came from such a diverse background you know, uh, of, of race and ethnic groups, cultures, religions, rural, urban. I mean, we were just one big melting pot, a, a true collaboration and a true representation of what America really is because we're all so diverse. And as we bonded and shared our experiences, uh, there became a common thread uh, throughout and uh, this common thread transcended our individual differences and really what led us to, um, to producing our recommendations to increase opportunity and decrease poverty in America. Uh, outlining six priority recommendations for creating ladders out of poverty for young adults born into poverty and motivated to climb up and out and areas of system reform that need immediate attention to change to improve the condition for poverty for everyone. Next I would just like to introduce Blonde Tree of the Core Network and uh, let her talk about her experience. Good morning, everybody. My name is Falantri. I'm from Flagstaff, Arizona. I am Towering House Clan, born for the Edgewater Clan of the Navajo Nation. And we'd like to first of all thank you all for allowing us the time and space to participate in this discussion around civic collaboration. Um, it is, um, we are not here to tell you about some of the discourses from our communities like having unemployment rates of 70%, or to tell you about how my one shower alone this morning, I used more water in that one shower than I use all week because the community I come from has no running water and lacks electricity. We understand these discourses exist in our communities, but we're here to celebrate with you all our success 
and our accomplishments from overcoming a lot of these challenges and obstacles. And we are also here to share with you all that actions for change, when grounded in love and led by moral and spiritual consciousness, we can transform our communities as well as our individual selves. And that we need to, con we need to empower our communities to be able to understand that they can be service providers and not always on the receiving end of being service recipients. And so with that, we express these experiences that we have to share with you some of the, our impacts of positive change for our communities and how that working with others and collaboration, sharing resources, sharing shared experiences and knowledge, we can together join to eliminate a lot of these stereotypes and a lot of these discourses that exist and that we are born into at no fault of our own. And with that, I would like to introduce my next council member to share with you some insights from her experience, Ms. Shanice Jackson with Public Allies. Good morning, everyone. I'm a community and youth advocate from Baltimore, Maryland. There's nothing I'm more passionate about than improving circumstances for young people especially those young people that are in poverty. I consider it my mission and my true passion to ensure that poverty is never a predictor of potential. It's because I was born into poverty 26 years ago by two teenage parents. My mom was a heroin addict, my father was a heroin dealer. Neither of them commenced past middle school, neither of them lived past 25. At seven, at my mom's funeral, I vowed to be different to go to school, to succeed, to not be a statistic. So I worked hard. I had great teachers, amazing mentors, and I became the first generation college student in my family to go off to school. <laughs> I felt like all my dreams were coming true. It just seemed like everything I had worked so hard for was just finally coming to the forefront. But three years into college, it seemed like all my dreams started falling apart. It became really clear that I could no longer afford to pay for it because somewhere in my quest for attaining and my quest for being more, I forgot that I was poor. Life has a funny way of giving us reality checks. I had no one to assist with funding my education. I didn't have family who was able to co-sign for loans for me. I had no guidance as to how I could stay on track to graduate, so I dropped out one year before my graduation, because I had to go out into work. But by the grace of God, I stumbled upon an amazing national service program called Public Allies Maryland. Public Allies allowed me to serve my community, they allowed me to earn a living allowance, and they allowed me to gain an education award that allowed me to go back to school. So after two amazing years of serving with Public Allies, I felt prepared to enroll into college and get back on track towards graduating positioned to make a difference back in my community in Baltimore and propelled into a career as a community and youth advocate. So now, my mission is very focused on opening doors of opportunity for everyone. Because even if every opportunity youth managed to climb out of poverty, that would still leave us with families, children, and communities that are still poverty stricken. So we must focus on changing the conditions that are rampant in low-income co communities so everyone can fulfill their potential and everyone can grow up in communities of opportunity. Not communities of hunger, not communities of poverty, not communities of crime or of fear or of chaos and death and abuse and drugs or of despair. If we're really serious about building communities of opportunity, we must also be serious about building, rebuilding the systems that perpetuate the chains of poverty. And I would like to introduce my fellow council member, Dion Jones with Be The Change. Good morning, everyone. So what we're trying to do is create and lead a movement of Opportunity Youth United because there are a million stories like the ones you just heard and we must liberate those stories. With power and great access and the ability to be in these spaces comes great responsibility. So it's important for me today to mention my first cousin's name, Ray Howes III, 
and his killer's name, Dewan Holloway. Ray Howes was 19 years old, his killer was 23. My cousin was killed three months ago, three blocks from our grandmother's house. And when I took my uncle, me and my grandfather, to see the tape at the police department at the, where he was shot at the convenience store, we saw that he was shot twice in the back, once in the foot, and a final shot in the head that came out of his jaw. As we then escorted my uncle to the hospital and to the lab, and we saw my cousin lay cold on the table with half of his face blown off, I knew why I was placed on earth. And so as I said at his funeral, my cousin is just as, is a victim, but also his killer is a victim. What if his killer had to be up early the next morning for an internship or job? Maybe he would have been asleep instead of looking out for a car to steal. What if his killer had a caring adult in his life or a mentor who could be a point of light that could create a pathway for opportunity for him? Maybe that mentor would have told him that we are more alike than we are different. What if he had to be in class the next morning at the community college that's only 10 minutes away from our neighborhood instead of being out that night looking for a car to steal? What if the last night DeWan got out of prison, he had a successful reentry program that he could go to so he could have been on a path to success? I wouldn't have sat in front of my cousin's casket and watched it be lowered into the ground. 19 years old. And I wouldn't be speaking his name today. So yes, the one was his physical killer, but his real killer was the lack of opportunity that existed in his space. So we need you and all of your resources and all of the power that Eric spoke about that's harnessed in this room to mobilize thousands of opportunity youth at all levels and speak up to break the chains of poverty, break the chains of every ism that exists, break the chains of severe unemployment. And it's going to take all of us to be race brave, to have that uncomfortable conversation about race, but it's also going to take all of us to be oppression brave, to have those, un those uncomfortable conversations about every ism that exists, because what I know for sure is, I can do things you cannot do. We can do things you cannot do. But together, we do do great things.